Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar organized by the Consortium for Research on Terrorism and International Crime. My name is Thurl Sønnesen and I am the research manager of for the Terrorism Research Project at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment or FFI, which together with NUPI and CUREX and all the institutions are part of the consortium. And the topic today is on technology and extremism and more specifically on how and to what extent uh, internet facilitates violent extremism. And we're also very grateful that we've been joined by no less than th three very distinguished speakers today for to address this very important topic and to gain us, help us gain some insights. <clears throat> and they have been given 15 minutes each for their presentation and they will open up for uh, questions and yeah, Q&A from the audience. So we can urge you all to use the Q&A function in, in Teams and to post your questions. And it should be open by now, so just post your questions and then we'll go through them uh, after all the presentations. It also you should be nice to know that this, this event will be recorded uh, and posted later on the YouTube page of the consortium. So it will be, be recorded. I will introduce all the three speakers uh, first. So uh, Ryan Scruvens is the first speaker. He is an assistant professor in the School of Criminal Justice at Michigan State University and has many publications, especially on right-wing extremism and especially in Canada. And the second speaker is Vivek Venkatesh, who amongst other things is associate professor in the Department of Education at the Concordia University in Montreal, Canada, and also UNESCO's co-chair uh, in prevention of radicalization and violent extremism. And this, these two have recently published an article on the role of internet in facilitating violent extremism through uh, interviews with former right-wing extremists. So that's very interesting uh, research. Our third speaker is Lydia Khalil. Uh, she is currently a research fellow uh, in the West Asia program at Lowy Institute in Australia. But Lydia has a very broad experience, both as a researcher and a policy advisor. And she will present a report she's written as part or in, uh, in contribution with the Global Network on Extremism and Technology uh, on the research community's engagement with the tech industry and also on the role technology play in violent extremism. And they join us from very different time zones. So it's very in, in Sydney, Australia, and in Canada and the United States. So it's very, we are very pleased that you all three could join us for this event. So uh, I think it's uh, Ryan. Uh, I think you should go first. You have 50 minutes. So if you can get up your presentation. Thanks very much. Just, just give me a second, if you don't mind, please. I'm... Yeah, of course. OK, can everybody hear and see me? All right, yes. thanks very much for having me today. Um, my name is Dr. Ryan Scribbins. I'm presenting a paper that was recently published titled The Role of the Internet in Facil Facilitating Violent Extremism, Insight from Former Right-Wing Extremists. This paper is in collaboration with Tiana Gaudet, who's a PhD student in the School of Criminal Justice at Michigan State University, as well as Dr. Vivek Venkatesh, who is on the call today. So this, like I said, this piece was recently published in uh, the journal Terrorism and Political Violence. Uh, Tiana Gaudet is the lead on this piece. Unfortunately, she was was unable to make it today. By uh, we're we're the second string um, backup band, but we're here to do a, as good of a job, hopefully. Um, this project is funded in part by Public Safety Canada and Concordia University's Horizon Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. And it's part of a broader project um, asking former extremists on how they think or what they think are effective strategies to prevent and combat violent extremism. Um, this project is also in collaboration with Project Someone, um, as well as the UNESCO Chair in Prevention of Radicalization and Violent Extremism, uh, both which uh, Vivek will discuss later on. Um, just as a quick and dirty overview, um, this project involves in-depth interviews of members of the right-wing extremist movement in Canada, um, as particularly on their use of the internet and the connection between their on and offline worlds during their involvement in violent extremism. Um, so just, uh, I guess, uh, conceptual clarifications. Um, our understanding of former violent extremists are those who at one time in their lives subscribe to and are perpetuated violence in the name of a particular extremist ideology and have since publicly and or privately denounced violence in the name of a particular extremist ideology. 
Um, some of your uh, uh, listeners will uh, be quite aware of the pros and cons of working with former violent extremists. Some of the pros include, um, um, oftentimes they do have inside knowledge, knowledge into a number of complex issues in terrorism and extremism studies, for example, such as ideologies, uh, group dynamics, networks, violence, pathways in and out, so on and so forth. However, there are cons working with former um, violent extremists. Uh, questions about credibility and reliability as to whether or not they are in fact who they say they were in the movement, for example, whether they're just making up stories to try to um, make themselves more appealing, for example. Um, and there are also concerns about them having a voice in the public space. There are those who believe that because they were violent extremists, they should not have the opportunity to engage in the process by um, which people leave extremism, for example. Um, at any rate, uh, I think I can speak for myself as well as Vivek and Tiana. There, uh, we think that the pros do outweigh the cons in this regard, um, but there are a lot of nuances associated with working with former extremists, uh, points that I can talk about during the Q&A if you so choose. Um, but what's interesting about this particular study, not only did we conduct in-depth interviews with right-wing extremists, um, the interview guide with which we used to interview former extremists was developed by law enforcement and community activists, key stakeholders. So what we're promoting here, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, is this multi-dimensional, multi-perspective interview guide. So our study contributes to the academic literature on violent political online extremism on 14 fronts. First, uh, the study addresses an important missing data issue that limits many studies relying on official and open source data to generate knowledge on one, the link between violent extremism um, and terrorism in general, as well as the interactions between the on and offline worlds of violent extremists in particular. Um, drawn from the voices of formers who have um, insider experience with the online dynamics of violent extremism offers first-hand accounts of the impact of and the consumption of networking around violent extremism online content, um, either in their uptake of extremist ideologies or their decision to engage in violent extremism. Um, and as your listeners will, will be well aware of, these are critical areas of research that many researchers, practitioners, and policy makers continue to be concerned with. Um, the second contribution is that although there is a surge of research on the intersections of violent extremism and the internet, relatively few empirically grounded analyses are yet available. So in other words, a little, empirical, little is empirically known about the internet's role in facilitating violent extremism, and even less is known about the link between the on and offline worlds of violent extremists. Um, the third contribution is that there's a growing body of literature that has sprung up um, since this project started, I don't know, I guess four maybe five years ago now, um, about, around drawn from the insights of former extremists in general and former right-wing extremists and Islamists in particular uh, to generate knowledge on the prevalence and contours of violent extremism. Scholars in this space still to this day um, have been much slower to ask former questions about their usage of the internet and activity during their involvement in violent extremism. And lastly, uh, touching on this uh, multi-dimensional um, interview guide. So little research in terrorism and extremism studies in general, or the role of the internet in facilitating violent extremism in particular, has conducted a needs analysis with key stakeholders, such as law enforcement and community activists, in preparation for interviews with former extremists. This is, this is an important oversight, um, as the landscape of violent online political extremism is complex and multifaceted. So, so too then should efforts to generate knowledge in this regard uh, be multi-dimensional, building on the expertise of diverse sectors. So key stakeholders may have firsthand experience with issues relating to violent extremism in the internet. So as a result, developing an interview guide that incorporates their questions places us as researchers in a much better position to ask questions that are informed by experiences and expertise of frontline officials. So together then, bringing this all together, the purpose of the exploratory study was to provide an in-depth account of former extremist use of the internet and the connection between their on and offline worlds during their involvement um, in violent extremism. And this was based on a series of questions provided by law enforcement officials and community activists. So I'm going to talk now about the, the study demographics, and this is quite interesting. So in total, we had 10 community activists, local community activists, as well as 30 law enforcement officials, all in a Canadian context, um, give us their questions that they wanted us to ask former extremists if they had the opportunity to ask them. Um, this was a bit of a complicated process because together we amassed over 550 questions. We had to try and make sense of them, organize them, remove duplicates, and we ended up trimming our question interview guide down to 275 questions. Um, the interview guide was essentially split up into two sections. The first one were questions around personal experiences with violent extremism, questions around before radicalization, during radicalization, um, experience while in the movement, uh, leaving the movement, and reflections after leaving the movement. 
Um, and then there were a set of questions, which was essentially the impetus of the study around how formers think that we can combat violent extremism. Questions around disengagement, de-radicalization, and preventing and countering violent extremism. And for each of these categories that I just listed, uh, questions were systematically asked about their identities, their roles, goals, activities, networks, uh, role of the internet, so on and so forth, as well as their interactions with and perceptions of law enforcement and community activists and anti-extremists. So just as an overview of participant demographics, and if you have more questions after, I'd be glad to answer them. In total, we had 10 participants. Now, some might think that's not a lot. Well, try interviewing five and see how that goes. It's, it's a really grueling process. It's very difficult to gain access to this oftentimes hidden community, um, especially in the current climate now where right-wing extremism, for example, seems to be the focus of uh, much public and media attention. Um, people who are currently or formally engaged in uh, violent extremism or extremist ideologies in general probably don't trust researchers, so they are mo most likely not willing to talk to them. But we managed to talk to 10, eight males and two females. And on average, the interviews range, um, were approximately four and a half hours in length, ranging from one and a half hours all the way to seven hours. Um, in total, we had approximately 36 hours of audio recorded content. And the vast majority of these participants uh, were formerly involved in violent racist skinhead groups in urban centers in Canada. Um, they define themselves essentially as the upper echelon of the Canadian movement, ranging, we had some presidents, we had some sergeants, we had enforcers, uh, musicians, and spokesperson. And on average, um, participants spent um, roughly 13 years in violent extremism, ranging from four years all the way to 22 years. Um, when we spoke to them back in 2018, I believe it was, on average, they were around 38 years old, um, ranging from 27 years old to 44 years old. And I guess perhaps most importantly is that the vast majority of these former extremists were defined themselves as off the grid, meaning they weren't individuals who, like a lot of you have probably seen, um, are kind of spokespersons for different research centers or spokespersons for um, different um, e exit programs. Um, these individuals were largely those who had not been engaged um, in any research project, project in any regard um, and essentially quietly left the movement. Um, and the reason why we wanted to connect with these off the grid formers is to get a raw unscripted account of their uh, use of the internet, for example, and the role it played in facilitating violent extremism. I'm having technical difficulties here. If you just bear with me for a second. Uh, my computer seems to have froze. Can you hear me by chance? Is it possible to un uh, yes, share my screen? And, uh, if you want to, I can just uh, shut down your sharing. Yes, if you wouldn't mind, please, and I'll and I'll just reshare it. For some reason, it just it, it seems to have frozen on me. Oh, it's it's moving now. It's moving now. Okay, we're good. Okay, let's try this again. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, so let's try this again. So. The study results are broken down into two sections, um, the internet and facilitating violent extremism and the internet and connecting the on and offline worlds of violent extremism. Can, can, can people see my screen? Yes, they can. So the, for the first set of results, um, participants overwhelmingly suggested that the internet played an important role in facilitating the process of radicalization to violence. Um, essentially, the internet provided unfeathered access to extremist content and a network of like-minded individuals. Uh, this essentially increased their exposure to violent extremist ideologies and violent extremist groups. Um, now, in terms of exposure, initial exposure to violent extremist content, three participants noted that they were first exposed as a result of accessing right-wing extremist content online. But importantly, most of these participants who were first exposed not, did not just stumble across it, as one participant put it. Instead, most people um, were directed online from other people online to the extremist content online. In fact, 70% um, were actually first exposed to the content via offline interactions, not online interactions. So here exposure most commonly occurred after a friend um, in the offline world who they knew and trusted directed them to violent extremist materials online. Um, but regardless of how they were first exposed to the content online, participants oftentimes describe this exposure as a critical point that sparked their interest, initial interest in violent extremism. Um, in terms of the form of content that they were first exposed to, um, the most common 
was uh, during their early initial radicalization process was right wing extremist literature and white power or right wing extremist music. Now, in terms of the literature, participants accessed this content. Um, it was mostly books and other uh, oftentimes short readings. And this was for the purpose, as one participant put it, as research and nothing more, nothing less. But white power music was by far, far the most popular form of extremist content that participants accessed online during their early stage of violent radicalization. And this is largely because one, lyrics were particularly effective in conveying violent extremist ideology. Sometimes they were subtle, um, sometimes they were not, but there was something engaging about the lyrics. And I don't know about anybody else on the call, but I know growing up, uh, music has been a very uh, influential uh, factor in my, li my life um, and is very influ influential in the participants' lives. And, and the music, the white power music, was oftentimes rooted in upbeat, catchy rhythms, which was effective in capturing their initial interest in violent extremist ideologies. Um, so as one participant put it, uh, music is a way to get your message across because a lot of people, especially young people, don't want to listen to long speeches. I did because, you know, that's just something I enjoyed. But for a lot of people, they just want to listen to loud music. They want to hear, you know, loud guitars and punk metal music, something they can mosh to and be angry. Um, music was a way to rally people together. It was a major recruitment tool. So there, in terms of their initial interest in ideologies, it's important to note that most participants um, noted that whether initial exposure happened on or offline, their initial interest in violent extremist ideology stemmed from wanting to be part of something, as one participant put it. Most described feeling isolated and disconnected from family and friends, which made them susceptible to recruitment and violent extremism. In short, they felt like they didn't belong anywhere. Um, in terms of immersion, so following initial exposure to violent extremist content, um, participants commonly reported that because they wanted to feel like they were part of the group, they continued to access a variety of right-wing extremist content to, as one participant put it, uh, indulge in their newfound curiosity. In fact, 50% spent a significant amount of time online each day immersing themselves in violent extremist ideologies during their initial process of violent radicalization. Um, now, most also noted that during their process of violent radicalization, they increasingly immerse themselves in right-wing extremist networks via online forums, social media platforms, and so on and so forth. And these spaces essentially allowed them to connect and communicate with supportive like-minded peers about grievances and perceived injustices, which made them essentially feel like they were part of a larger quote-unquote community. Um, engaging in these communities essentially reaffirmed their radical views and by extension, facilitated uh, their process of violent radicalization. Um, but importantly, the internet allowed participants to connect and communicate with veteran or seasoned members of the right-wing extremist movement. This, according to seven participants, was a key element that facilitated their involvement in violent extremism, because these veterans essentially took them under their wings and provided them with a significant amount of knowledge and time um, related to movement activities. So moving on to the second section, I'm going to try and move through this really quick. I might just take one extra minute and I apologize. Um, when asked about how the internet connected their on and offline worlds during their involvement in violent extremists, participants noted that both worlds did not operate independently from one another. It was essentially blurred. So instead, both worlds um, were intertwined with their activities, their identities, and need for security. Um, in terms of their activities, 80% explained how online forums, chat rooms, so on and so forth, were essentially ideal spaces to advertise events being held offline by violent extremists. Um, this included designated forums for violent extremist groups. Uh, they, they advertised uh, concerts, uh, gatherings, the more genetic, generic um, forums such as Stormfront, advertised offline events such as rallies and protests. And interestingly, the purpose was not only to encourage adherents to connect with others offline, but encourage movement related activities. And in some cases, in many cases, uh, the use of violence offline. Um, in addition, a key feature of the online platform that facilitated offline connections was the interactive and localized nature of these spaces. So here, the like-minded could seek out, connect, and interact with local adherents, not just international adherents um, who shared the same views as them. Um, in terms of identities, this is pretty interesting. Participants often describe, described how their on and offline identities were interconnected during their involvement. Um, and over half reported no substantial difference between their on and offline identities. So for three participants, they maintain the same on and offline identities to represent what they described as an authentic version of themselves and their beliefs, as well as for the purpose of connecting with authentic connections, other violent extremists. However, four participants were convinced that there were discrepancies between the on and on offline identities of others. Um, they largely described people as net Nazis or keyboard warriors, people who were willing to talk tough online, but were not willing to meet offline. And lastly is the security. So 80% noted that during their involvement in violent extremism, they were concerned that law enforcement and anti-racists were essentially monitoring their activity. Um, as a result, 
they were cautious about what they were doing online. But they, interestingly, most were still willing to share their identities, at least some folks. Um, they essentially scrutinize other people's activities online to make sure that they weren't being infiltrated by law enforcement. Um, in addition, what they also did was they some would avoid personal uh, use of their computers to access extremist content. Um, they would back then they go to Internet uh, cafes or go to the library and, and a lot modified their security settings on social media profiles to avoid the potential of being detected from law enforcement. So putting this all together, what does this all mean? So there's a couple of key takeaways here, and I'd love to describe this in more detail. I don't want to take up much more of your time. In terms of exposure and immersion, exposure most often, exposure to extremist content, most often initial extremist, uh, initial exposure to extremist content, most often occurs after a friend in the offline world directed them to the content. They didn't just stumble across the stuff. However, it's also important to note that those who were susceptible to recruitment into violent extremism and, ha and had a, had a, essentially had a desire to belong to something, and that's what initially sparked their interest in violent extremist ideologies. But regardless of how someone first exposed, the internet eventually facilitated the process of violent extremism by enabling them to immerse themselves in the content. Um, and lastly, in terms of the on and offline nexus, um, it's quite clear that we see in, in, a, a fusing, if you will, of the on and offline worlds of violent extremists that are integrated or um, immersed in their extremist activities, identities, and need for security. Violent extremism obviously cannot be conceived as an on and offline dichotomy, and that's what uh, the limited empirical research has been telling us for some time. We're also finding that. Um, in terms of limitations future research, I will leave that for now. Um, if, if you want to talk about it during the keynote, I'd love to, but I don't want to take up much more of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for a very interesting, very um, pre good presentation. And I'm sure you can discuss it more in the Q&A. And I turn over to, to Vivek in uh, Montreal, uh, Canada. And also, uh, I urge you to post your questions using the uh, and, and comments using the Q&A function in, in Teams. So and then we will uh, open up for discussion after the, all the presentations. Can, can I ask that you unshare my screen? For some reason, um, Teams has a mind of its own on my computer. Yeah. I'll, I'll take care of that. Thank you. So you should be seeing my screen now. Is that right, Osmund? Yes, I can see it at least. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks so much, uh, Ryan. Thanks so much to uh, to our organizers for uh, for this for extending this invitation. It's a, a real pleasure to speak to you about some of the work that Ryan has been leading. Um, I wanted to to take some time today to perhaps draw attention to how we should orient educational frameworks. Perhaps think about things in a more humanist orientation as opposed to something that's more grounded in security uh, and uh, draw from the voices of these former extremists. I think uh, what Ryan mentioned early on is really important. The fact that these are primary data that we're working with and that, uh, that it's important for us to take multidisciplinary approaches. And this is something that Ryan was really open to when, uh, when he joined our team to collaborate with us on this project. So I'll be talking about a paper that, uh, that my team alongside Ryan and Tiana are preparing for publication soon that looks specifically at the role of education and the former's perceptions about the role of education in shaping their extremist beliefs. So I'll try and link this to the online versus offline considerations given the topic of this seminar, but also draw you to uh, draw your attention to some of the work that we're doing as part of our team, which is more oriented towards public forms of pedagogies and online pedagogies. How can we leverage the internet, for example, to sensitize the public about mm -hmm. some of the ill effects of hate? Uh, and how can we, in fact, build more inclusive society? Uh, so uh, that's, that's where I'm grounded. And so my professorship in, in visual arts, as well as the, the chairpersonship I hold at UNESCO PREV, which is the Prevention of Radicalization and Violent Extremism, is really the basis for this work and how my work gets funded. So our team, we, we have a, a fairly multidisciplinary team. Ryan and Tiana uh, come from a background in, in criminology and multidisciplinary forms of criminology. Uh, one of the main research assistants, uh, her name is Ashley Montgomery, and she specializes in, um, in anti-racist pedagogies. Uh, Ramya Panchacharam was one of our research assistants from political science, and they, uh, she was 
closely involved in coding these data and uh, thinking through how the data that uh, that Ryan collected so diligently would be able to frame arguments around education. Uh, I work also with a musicologist, Meha Saint Laurent, who's finishing her uh, postdoc in our in our um, in our lab. Uh, who also assist in the coding, and uh, Maxime Berube, who's a collaborator of ours, of, uh, of Ryan's of mine, who is also a criminologist, and Olivier Avizé, who is specialized, in fact, in education uh, within uh, communities that are politically unstable. So he's worked a lot in Iraq and in Palestine with, um, I, I, would, I would imagine, marginalized communities, uh, marginalized youth. So I'm trying to ensure that when we look at these data and we begin to classify the information, we begin to think carefully around how codes can um, can breach disciplinary boundaries. Uh, what I'd like to talk about broadly is how we're framing the literature review for our for our paper, and that is around the notion of resilience. Uh, it's important to consider that you know resilience in and of itself. We use the word a lot. I've been guilty of using the word a lot in framing some of the work that we're conducting with the youth, uh, with, um, uh, in terms of secondary prevention, with communities that are afflicted by violence, and even uh, in terms of uh, tertiary prevention when, uh, when framing the work that Ryan was leading. But resilience in and of itself has a massive load on the person who's experiencing it and the person who's developing it. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we don't tend to recall uh, developmental psychology like the ones that uh, Godet from 2007 talks about in schools, understanding how adolescence uh, talks about phases from dependency to self-autonomy and how resilience has developed very differently in youth than it is in adults. We take a psychological orientation, maybe even a clinical psychiatric orientation to resilience and broadly uh, think about resilience as a capacity to achieve successful outcomes despite adversity. So how is it that you're able to think through pragmatically, all right, I have a, a goal, I have an objective, how am I going to uh, attempt to be successful in this goal uh, despite the roadblocks that are ahead of me? But what's really key for us is that there's very limited research about how resilience is developed in educational frameworks. So if we are to think about primary prevention, and we're, we're also trying to bring to bear former's perceptions of their experiences in schools, how can we think about resilience as a humanist orientation? Uh, when we do publish our paper, you'll see a few, uh, a few reviews, key reviews of educational initiatives. It's not that there are not a lot of ed educational initiatives. This past year, I've been working closely with UNESCO in Paris, thinking carefully about how prevention of violence in schools, prevention of pathways that lead to extremism is a whole community approach, uh, demands a whole community approach. Uh, we looked at some literature and some evaluations of programs like Beyond Bali, which is based in Australia, and this looks specifically at building moral agencies, um, you know, uh, ensuring that you look at communal values that are shared, uh, but also shifting rooted beliefs, which can be quite difficult. Uh, you know, think, think about of the conflicted notions that you may have of wanting to develop your independence, develop an identity, and how those are grounded in, in very, very strong beliefs and ideologies. Uh, there are some programs that have looked at self-sanctioning. So how do you teach someone to, uh, to, to, to think around right, what, kinds of, um, what kinds of outcomes, what kinds of outcomes do I not want to achieve should I follow a certain path? So how can you teach self-sanctioning? So this is something interesting for us in terms of uh, the data that we were observing with former extremists. Uh, I'm a big uh, fan of Paulo Freire uh, and thinking carefully about how his work, especially what was expressed in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and thinking through horizontally how we can help build pluralism. Uh, this is something that Boyd McMillan and his colleagues have talked about in educational programs. How do you build pluralism? How do you get people to speak freely, to create not safe spaces as much as brave spaces where you can think through um, rationale and logic without fear of reprisal? and also engage in role playing because that also uh, uh, brings to bear what we're talking about here in terms of developing empathy and perspective taking. From the standpoint of online environments, I think one of the things to keep in mind is, uh, especially in the last 18 months, as we've seen misinformation uh, campaigns and even uh, more purposeful disinformation campaigns take hold on the internet, how can we encourage critical questioning? So a lot of the programs like the Sabaun program, uh, and others that you will be able to read in our review 
have talked about how you, to build criticality. How do you build criticality? Much easier said than done. Um, and part of what happens is allowing pluralism to take hold, allowing for time and space to reflect and not rushing to judgment. So on to the meat. Uh, Ryan did a really good job of describing how he uh, framed the interview guides, how we collected the and uh, actually allowed our team to be able to work with him in coding this. Uh, in terms of farmers' perceptions, you know, uh, one of the things we have to think about carefully while framing these data is uh, how reliable are these memories of the of the farmers? As Ryan pointed out, we certainly believe in our team that the pros outweigh the cons, but what we have done here is adopt a constructivist grounded theory approach. So uh, through careful analysis and inter uh, rater reliability, we're ensuring that only themes that repeat themselves are, um, are approximating some sort of theoretical saturation. So we, we talk about and we found certain themes that uh, that speak specifically about physical violence and bullying in general. And uh, for example, participant 10 here would say that you know, you'd be with friends and they'd start dogpiling on him. It's a pack mentality. A lot of what goes into notions of tribalism. Uh, we've studied this elsewhere with my colleague Jeff Potashan in terms of consumer culture, uh, you know, becoming part of a larger gang and thinking that you know um, and the, you could perhaps get lost and your identity might be subsumed within the larger gang. So a lot of physical violence preceded uh, joining or at least adopting these extremist uh, ideologies. A lot of our um, our former right wing extremists who we who we interviewed talked about cultural differences in their classrooms. So um, many a time uh, they they made a point, especially uh, uh, given the, the anti-Semitic nature of uh, a lot of the right wing extremism extremist movements uh, and now also seeing a lot of um, uh, anti immigration sentiments. But the the uh, the data themselves bore out, for example, a uh, a targeting of people who belong to a different group, who belong to a group that were being maligned and uh, with whom you uh, you perhaps shared an antipathy, right? So uh, in this particular case, one of the participants talked about uh, ending up taking the kid's head, as they put it, and smashing it in the wall. There was a, that particular trigger was trying to steal their uh, their bottle of Coke uh, from the machine, right? So how is it that we can also understand the context within this violence is playing out and how the trigger is necessarily a cultural difference that they that they see and say, OK, you are an outsider. There is a certain xenophobia that takes hold, right? And a xenophobia in a very literal sense of the word, an irrational fear of the other. Uh, you know, uh, here a lot of times people talked about the Jewish lobby organization and, uh, you know, uh, buying into the party line that they're pushing this uh, their legitimacy of legitimacy of their organization um, and, and uh, it was interesting to see that within within their communal structures within their familiar structures uh, in this particular case participant three talks about having confrontations with their with his parents or with their parents so to what extent is the opening of a dialogue and the will that you are going to make errors in judgment and rationale important for us to consider as we think about more humanist orientations towards pedagogies. Um, and here it's interesting as well. I want to include this because there's really an attempt for this participant to try and control the school environment, trying to deal with the environment. And as they point out, I quote, I just couldn't get a grasp on it. Uh, it's one thing for us, uh, especially in the UNESCO project I was talking about earlier, it's one thing for us to say, all right, we need to have a whole society approach and in schools we need to be able to train and enable and empower school psychologists and counselors to uh, to uh, to find ways to uh, uh, you know open lines of conversations with students who are falling into these violent ideologies. Uh, you know, but the participants were saying that for the majority of them, it was pretty hard to do so. Um, here, if you see uh, what they're saying, a lot of the stuff, it's especially if you're a kid, you don't listen. So uh, I'm sure I'm trying to put myself in that situation. I'm trying to talk you out of it. And if you want to get in, you're going to get in. There's a certain uh, apathy if you, if uh, it's not something that I would I would necessarily put in as a theme for this paper, uh, but it's something that I see after having revisited and uh, and re uh, reread and re listened to some of these interviews. There's a certain apathy that sets in, uh, and so it's our responsibility to think about how broader school psychology uh, 
uh, frameworks need to account for this within uh, within the era of counseling. So how perhaps counseling works for those who haven't fallen into the ideologies. Now, how do you measure falling into that ideology deep enough? Uh, and how do you then counter the, the kind of apathy that you see uh, perhaps in this kind of, uh, of statement from participant 10? Um, one of the final things also I'd want to say is that when we talked to our participants, they were very often uh, uh, I don't know what's here, but there were talks about how in Canada, for example, there is a preponderance of left wing ideologies. And so there, there, there's a suggestion that universities, especially uh, to, to those who are fallen into right wing ideologies, universities may seem as promoting too much of a left wing ideologies. How do you therefore think about something that's more pluralistic in orientation? Uh, how do you also in this day and age think about freedom of speech, freedom of academic expression, exposing learners to multiple points of view, giving them the tools to think through critically and say, here's the kind of political position I want to take around an issue and why I think that works best, understanding that there are pros and cons to it. Um, you know, but very often uh, people would fall back on the fact that uh, the percentage of people who are extremists is very, very low in the world. Uh, and so to be careful about associating religion to extremism. And these were, I think, really important aspects of uh, of uh, pedagogies that can be included of extremists voices. So I want to tie things together at the end to especially with the online environment to draw your attention to some of the work that we're doing in our in our chair and at Project Someone. Uh, we have a, an open online course which is free to take. It's offered in three languages, English, French and Arabic. The next uh, the next um, uh, round of this course happens, in fact, in November. Registration is open on October 4th. Uh, and this is a 10 hour course, which takes about five weeks to complete. We call it From Hate to Hope or De La Haine à l'Espoir. And uh, importantly for this particular course, we have included interviews, video interviews with some uh, former extremists, Islamists, right wing extremists. They were not involved in in uh, in the project that Ryan and I were working on, uh, uh, the one that we're talking about today. But they agreed uh, these people, in fact, agreed to to be interviewed and we include them alongside experts in, from a variety of fields to think through how we can build resilience. Uh, and what's I think unique about our online course is the fact that while we do present content and we have uh, uh, opportunities to discuss those uh, through traditional means, we also have a multilingual forum where people can uh, uh, contribute and answer questions about how they themselves in their in their respective organizations are working through strategies to build resilience against extremism. So we've worked with mental health experts, social service organizations, teachers, obviously. Uh, and, uh, you know, so go go to our website and register for this uh, for this course if it does interest you. We're the first time we launched it. We had 500 participants from 55 countries. So it was a really nice experience for us uh, to uh, to observe and to to uh, to join people on this journey. Um, I've been working for a while in terms of documenting uh, how communities are building resilience from within and uh, a lot of this work is framed uh, and was really nicely framed because uh, it was um, it was it that Ryan was conducting in terms of how communities can help stave off uh, adoption of violent ideologies. There's a series of documentaries we filmed in a community called Mercier S, so Mercier East in Montreal, and this is a community uh, collective called Solidarité Mercier Est who help out immigrants, uh, especially Francophone immigrants who are coming from the Maghreb and from uh, from Africa uh, into Montreal, into a, a mostly impoverished region of Montreal. We are working with youth as well who are in danger of dropping out of school and uh, joining gangs. So how is it that we can build capacity from within? Uh, we're, we're trying to find ways in which these documentaries can also leverage uh, a number of our online pedagogies that are available for, for viewing on our website, but we're also now integrating them into curriculum in school. So that's one way I think that we can start bridging this, this, um, this humanist orientation around uh, critical pedagogies. I've also worked with sessions in the Norwegian scene and um, organizers and artists. And this is a photo of a panel session that we held in Quebec City, where we were discussing how uh, extreme metal music and uh, right wing extremism or extreme metal music and violent ideologies. How can we sort of break through some of the tired tropes uh, 
of uh, violence that is uh, that is perhaps caused by musical musical frameworks and in music scenes. Uh, and so in hosting these discussions, what we wanted to do also was to tear down some of the uh, the presumptions that uh, may be made around violence as it's attributed to music scenes, but also uh, confront some of the the hateful uh, the hateful ideologies that have perpetrated within music scenes. These have been particularly successful because, uh, you know, it's one thing to come and listen to a lecture that I'm hosting uh, or to be in a class that you have to attend because you're taking a university course with me. But it's another to arrive at a show for a band that you're really fond of and to have them think through uh, some of the more critical notions of pedagogy. So hats off to uh, to my to my colleagues and friends. Uh, in bands like Enslaved and in the uh, in the larger uh, music scene in Bergen uh, in, in Western Norway for collaborating with us on these projects. Uh, we also work very closely with youth, and this is going to be my last, uh, last element to share with you, is we also work very closely with youth uh, to help build criticality on social media. If we're going to talk about online uh, environments and we're going to talk about the ease with which youth leverage social media, but also the ubiquity of social media, we need to find ways to sensitize them, but also allow them spaces to consider how to deploy social media to magnify their own narratives. This is a screenshot of an application that I created with some colleagues called Plural, and Plural behaves like all other social media, except that the three things that you would expect to do in social media, like comment, are extinguished from this application. So when we conduct workshops using plural, we get our youth to think carefully about what would you want to post when you know that the only thing people are going to do is read your post, read the whatever 300 characters or view the video that you post. How can you contextualize it? How difficult is it to contextualize it? And how easy is it for someone to just piece that material together, put it into another sequence and make a different meaning from it? Uh, you know, we're not uh, we're not uh, under any illusions that this is something that's going to revolutionize the way we think about social media. But again, a lot of this stems from the work that we've done uh, uh, with Ryan around how we can build more humanist orientations towards online pedagogies. And so these are some uh, photographs of of um, workshops that we hold with youth where we use sampling and remixing techniques. Uh, we work uh, with a variety of instruments, synthesizers. Um, panel sessions that are hosted by musicians. Like I was saying, people are more more likely to listen to and speak with uh, representatives from cultural scenes as they are to academics in these contexts. Uh, I'll stop here. Uh, you can check us out on projectsomeone.ca or uh, also on our uh, UNESCO chair website, shareunesco-prev.ca. But don't hesitate to write me and uh, we can continue this conversation. And I look forward to questions that uh, we have. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek, for a very interesting presentation and also for information on all your engagement project and workshops. That's a really important, so that's very important work. And now we are moving from Canada to Sydney to uh, Australia to Lydia Khalil in a very different time zone. And good evening, Lydia. I think it's evening <laughs> for you. So please go ahead if you have your have a presentation and um, yes. Uh, yes, is it coming up yet on on the screen share? Yes, I can see it. OK, it is great. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you once again for extending the invitation to have me join you today. Um, it's a real uh, it's a real privilege um, to share the screen with Ryan and Vivek, you know, two um, exceptional researchers who are doing some really interesting and cutting edge work as um, as they previewed here. Uh, just by a quick introduction, once again, um, my name is Lydia Khalil. I'm a research fellow at the Lowy Institute. I also hold some academic appointments at the Alfred Deakin Center at Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and I also coordinate the Avert Research Network, which is a, a Australian-based global network of um, terrorism and violent extremism and researchers. Um, based out of my work in Sydney University, I'm also a member for the Centre on Resilient and Inclusive Society, which also does work around resilience and violent extremism. Um, and today um, I'm going to brief you on uh, a report that I did for GNET, which was based on a survey on the role of technology in violent extremism and the state of the research community and tech industry engagement. Um, now, uh, this report was um, part of uh, 
of the Global Network on Extremism and Technology, and I thought it might be useful um, just to give a brief background on GNET. It's a GNET is an academic research initiative that's backed by the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism, also known as GIFCT, which is an industry-funded, a tech industry-funded initiative, but independent initiative to uh, that aims to understand and counteract terrorist use of technology. GNET is convened by um, the International Center for the Study of Radicalization out of King's College London, but while it's led out of King's College, it also involves a number of core partners, the Lowy Institute in Sydney, Australia being one of those core partners. I manage that core partnership, which entails uh, basically commissioning insights and blog posts from a number of researchers in the Asia Pacific uh, and Australasia region on violent extremism and technology. We hold a number of workshops um, and also uh, do major reports, one of which I'm presenting on today. Um, now, when uh, putting together, um, uh, excuse me, sorry, just losing my screen here. Um, so in, in putting together um, this, uh, this report, we sought to answer um, two key questions really um, about um, extremism, uh, because, you know, the role of technology, particular computer mediated communications, what role it plays in violent extremism is such a broad question that it has a number of sub questions underneath it, um, you know, such as what role does the Internet, particularly social media, play in the radicalization process? Has the use of social media increased the production and exposure to violent extremist content? Does this exposure radicalize individuals to violence? Um, does the use of computer computer mediated communication uh, and social media platforms make it easier to recruit or mobilize individuals to join join violent extremist causes? Um, is there something about the technologies and the platforms themselves, you know, their design, logic, affordances, and limitations that contributes to and facilitates extremism? Um, and if an individual does come to espouse extremist beliefs via online exposure to extremist narratives and content, or if they participate in online subcultures, does that ne then necessarily lead to violence, militancy, or other types of offline harms? Now, all of these questions are by no means exhaustive, no, nor are they new. Um, you know, since extremist actors have been some of the earliest adopters of the internet and recognized its potential as a communication and mobilization tool, early on, you know, we've had researchers grappling with these and similar questions around the role of technology and extreme, extremism really for decades now, but particularly since the rise of uh, the, or the advent of the Islamic State because of its global re reach, its adept use of social media, which um, challenged, I think, researchers and counterterrorism officials alike. Um, and while these questions and concerns aren't new and they've been asked in a myriad of ways, our report centered around these two very broad categories, which are what does the evidence based research say about the role of computer mediated communications, communications and extremism? And what's the level and the state of engagement between the tech industry and the research community? Now, um, it also begs the question of why do a um, uh, an expert survey in order to try to answer these questions. Um, after all, traditionally researchers would conduct a literature review of the available research. And indeed, there have been a number of high quality literature reviews of both my co-panelists have um, contributed to um, of the available research on the role of internet and technology on radicalization to violent extremism over the years. And these reviews have been incredibly important in understanding the state of the field and the research community's assessment of the role of internet technologies in violent extremism. But as many of the literature reviews themselves noted, a lot of the reviews skewed toward the study of jihadist actors because of the prevalence of research in that area up until recently. Um, and so the, the literature has tended to focus less on other ideologies, particularly right wing ideologies that are now presenting a significant threat across jurisdictions globally and are now the subject of an increasing number of emerging research papers that may not have yet been included in, in past literature reviews. The literature reviews were also conducted and written to prior to the pandemic with its full impact on society and extremism yet to be properly examined. Um, but the survey was conducted during the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. And also, um, you know, the research conclusions in the literature are really only as good as the data that they rest on. And the literature review is less 
able to adequately illuminate issues around researcher access to data, which impacts both the type and quality of the literature that's being reviewed, and access to that data depends on some degree on the level of engagement with the tech industry. So in order to complement these past literature reviews, we sought to gain an understanding of the, you know, a current, a more current understanding of the research community's findings that may not be included in previous lit literature, um, and to understand the academic research community's level of engagement with the tech industry. And so we conducted the survey among researchers of terrorism and violent extremism. Um, I compiled a database of researchers from a number of sources, uh, the editorial boards of prominent journals in the fields of terrorism and extremism studies. The database also drew on GNET associate fellows and GNET insight contributors whose work we knew we know focused on internet and extremism. Other experts who are part of recognized research institutes and networks focusing on extremism and terrorism were also identified and added to the database. And in addition to um, you know, established and published researchers, early career researchers and those focusing on issues around terrorism and technology were also identified via various research conference programs. And also the questions were deliberately worded so as not to solicit um, opinions or impressions, but have respondents base their answers on empirically based research either they've conducted themselves or have reused in their work. Um, there were over 44 questions um, in the survey, but I'll preview only a few of those findings now um, and the rest can be found uh, in the report. So the first question sought to solicit views regarding whether online extremist activity satiates a desire for real world action or stokes it, encourages or mobilizes individuals to take offline action. Um, and when we asked the participants of the survey, um, and I don't know if I had mentioned it, but uh, we had 158 particip expert participants respond to the survey. Um, and when we asked if online activity by extremist actors either support, encourage, or mobilize real world harm, uh, or whether it satisfies a desire for action by online or virtual activity alone, or both, the majority of respondents, about 60%, said either support, encourage, or mobilize real world harm, or both, it's 36%. And very few respondents actually saying that strictly online activity satisfies a desire for, um, for action. That's really interesting to note because um, uh, it was interesting to note that the majority of those canvas concluded that online activity leads to real world, world harms, particularly because, you know, some research and even some of the respondents to the survey suggested that some individuals restrict themselves only to online activity and pose no offline risk. Um, it was also interesting finding because it contrasted with some previous studies on jihadists, which found virtual activity can carry similar legitimacy and impact as jihadist real world action. Um, similarly, the, the, the survey respondents found that regarding recruitment and whether internet enabled communications had made it easier to recruit individuals to extremist movements, there was broad agreement that it has. About 90% of the expert respondents agreed or strongly agreed with this. Um, likewise, when we asked if the internet has made it easier for people to plan attacks or to mobilize to violence, the majority of respondents, about 84%, agreed or strongly agreed that it made it easier to mobilize. But many responses also, respondents also caveated their answers by saying that while the internet, particularly encrypted communication, may have made it easier to mobilize, they found that detailed attack planning occurs, often occurs mostly offline, particularly for sophisticated plots. When we dug a little deeper uh, and asked more specifically if exposure or engagement with on extremist content leads to offline harm, uh, responses were less decisive um, as the previous ones. The res survey responses echoed a lot of the literature reviews in revealing that engaging with extremist content can be a contributing factor, but it's not a causal or determinative or sufficient enough factor. Uh, according to one respondent who said there's a lot of predisposing factors before any interaction with extremist content can lead to offline actions, and the causal pathway is not going to be clearly discernible. However, um, this may be because as a majority of research respondents indicated that research was inconclusive, or we don't have enough evidence to this, or there's not good enough data, or the research is use, uses very limited data, um, or there's minimal empirical research that clearly shows a connection between exposure and interaction with extremist content and offline harm. Um, 
these responses kind of echo longstanding concerns in the field regarding access to data and the need for more large end studies. And when asked about how certain individuals accessed or were exposed to extremist content, um, specifically through algorithmic recommendation functions of social media platforms, about a majority, 62% agreed or strongly agreed uh, that that was the case, but were more circumspect about whether it played a part in an individual's path toward radicalization. So while algorithmic uh, recommendation or recommender systems played an important role in amplifying content or exposure to content, it was less clear whether that ex increased exposure led toward an ind individual's path toward radicalization or what's popularly termed as going down the rabbit hole. Um, and many pointed to the fact that the research was inconclusive um, and that there was insufficient research on how algorithmic recommendation factors into the recommendation process, largely because um, there's not a lot of transparency around recommender systems in the first place. Um, some of the research that was um, identified as part of the survey around extremist content and algorithmic recommendation focused on YouTube. And one respondent who indicated that they had done research on algorithmic recommendations found that recommendation algorithms were, were a key driver for recruitment, radicalization, and, and propaganda. And another researcher who did work in this space said that there was strong evidence to suggest that recommender algorithms at the very least can cause desensitization, which can then lower a viewer's inhibition to violence. Next, we asked about um, deplatforming and content moderation and what the research says about that. Uh, when respondents were asked about content moderation, whether removing or suppressing extremist content was an effective means of countering extremism and reducing real world harm, um, of those who are aware or of, of conducted research in this topic, um, you know, they tended to fall in two positions, either strongly agree uh, that that was the case, about 48% found that, um, and then another uh, slightly less uh, percentage, 37%, found that the research was inconclusive, that it was an effective means of countering extremism or offline harms. Um, many of the respondents did agree that it was uh, an effective means of countering extremism. Uh, many of the respondents who did agree to that also noted that content moderation was only one means of intervention, and it's only one piece of a puzzle in an overall strategy, but that in and of itself, it was not enough to be an effective counter extremism strategy um, in this day and age. But almost half, however, found that content moderation had an impact on their ability to access data and to conduct research on this topic, um, with 37% um, saying that, uh, excuse me, 49% saying that the content moderation has led to a change in their research focus and that content had been blocked or removed or made inaccessible um, and therefore could not have be, could not be studied. And many respondents made a point that there needs to be a more systematic archiving of extremist content and accounts to aid in research. There was a lot more in the report about respondents' evidence-based views on deplatforming. Um, I'm not going to get into it right now, um, but a lot of it can be, be found um, in, in the report. The second part of the survey um, focused on um, the researcher's engagement with the tech industry itself. Um, this is an important thing to understand because much of the data that helps us answer the questions around the role of technology in extremism lies with the tech industry. And researcher access to this data, uh, access to industry stakeholders, their level of engagement with industry impacts how well researchers can answer these questions. Um, and so we sought to gain an insight into if and how researchers engaged with the tech sector, um, where much of this data is held. And when we asked what type and level of engagement uh, people have had with the technology companies, you know, the answers uh, varied very widely. They ran across the spectrum from working very closely with technology companies, co-producing research, briefing them on research updates, to absolutely no engagement at all. Um, and much of that engagement we found was actually through the GIFCT, through GNET, or either that um, some specialized academic conferences. There was also a number of responses that indicated a particular cynicism around um, tech industry engagement with the academic community. You know, one respondent had said, tech companies don't quote unquote engage. They just look like they're addressing a problem while continuing the same practice until, you know, crisis forces change. You know, respondents also said that industry was 
keen to see research, but much less forthcoming with providing insights into what their platforms are doing in order to aid research um, in extremism. One key motivating factor, however, for researchers to engage with industry, industry was, not surprisingly, access to data. Um, but when we asked researchers if they approached uh, a tech company to obtain data to inform their research, a vast majority, 75% said no. And those who did ask, um, the majority of those who did ask were not able to obtain said data. Some respondents who indicated that they initially didn't ask social media companies for data either understood that company policies in terms of service didn't allow for this, or they found that they didn't have appropriate channels to approach tech company representatives um, in order to uh, negotiate access to data. To data. And a lot of respondents, you know, uh, put comments around the likes that um, inquiring about research engagement with industry around data sharing or anything else was highly opaque. And many respondents commented that they were unsure what opportunities for engagement were available, who to contact, how to contact them, and simply that engagement with the text texture uh, also wasn't a priority for them. So inability to access data from um, their engagement with the tech industry was one limitation to some of the research that we're seeing on this question of the role of technology uh, in violent extremism. But there are other limitations um, with, with respect to research in this area that has nothing to do with the tech industry. Uh, things like the academic ethics approval process and internal review boards, uh, legislation across various jurisdictions and privacy considerations all impact data access. And the result of this has been to force many researchers to rely on secondary data. So things like privacy, privacy considerations, ethic approvals process, the terms of service agreements on the platforms have meant that it's actually been very difficult for researchers to study an, individual on, an individual's online activity and or the, an individual's engagement with extremist content, um, all of which could have provided very important insights if researchers had access to this. Um, when respondents have been able to do so, it was either through accessing court documents, you know, relating to their violent extremist activity through secondary open source data, um, such as press response uh, responses or questionnaires um, like Ryan's research uh, uh, indicated to us earlier um, in the panel. There was only a handful of respondents who indicated they've been able to do in-depth analysis of an individual's online activity, as well as any longitudinal, new, uh, longitudinal studies of an individual's uh, and tracking their online activity before they become involved in militant activity or do any comparative studies of uh, behavior of violent and nonviolent extremists. So there were, um, limitations to the survey uh, approach that I think it's also important to acknowledge. Um, the results that were reported as part of the survey were based on a non-random sample and they represented only the views of the people who responded to the questionnaire. So aside from the criteria that I described earlier for building this database of potential respondents, we didn't devise any further methods to determine um, a respondent's level of engagement with the issues or their exact expertise around technology and extremism. Um, so given the fact that many of the res respondents to our survey chose to remain anonymous, we also couldn't identify or ver verify their level of research expertise or their experience involved in answering the survey questions. Um, additionally, there could be researchers, and I'm sure there were, uh, researchers and experts who may have relevant research experience around these issues who did not respond to the survey. Um, a majority of the, the 158 respondents also listed North America and Europe as their primary geographic area, which of course will also skew the results to this. Um, so I think in future, we would definitely like to see um, an additional iteration of this survey. Um, and many qu of the questions that were posed on the impact of technology, particularly social media um, and computer mediated communications on violent extremism were comparative in nature. However, as some of the respondents pointed out, there's been very little to no research on, that compares pre and post internet environment. And that's a gap in the research. So we've, we devised a lot of the initial questions around this comparative framing, and that's something that's gonna have to be uh, adjusted in any future surveys. Um, and it's gonna impact how research and survey questions on these topics are designed in the future. <clears throat> 
Um, the questions around violent extremism via deplatforming and content moderation also needed to be narrower in focus, uh, focusing on rather on the rather than on the effectiveness of countering violent extremism. Perhaps the focus of the question should be more specific. Similarly, there needs to be further refinement uh, with questions on the role of exposure to content. Um, and a number of the respondents to the survey helpfully added notes. Um, for the need for more specificity and precision on the survey question design. And I wholeheartedly uh, agree with that. Um, and so I'll, I'll conclude there and I will say, um, you know, I'd welcome any um, insights, feedback um, and opportunities to collaborate for further refinement of, of the survey. And thank you once again for having me. Well, thanks Lydia for a very interesting presentation. And thanks again also to, to Ryan and uh, and we catch for your presentations. I know we have some 20 minutes, 25 minutes left for Q&A. Uh, and we have all, already received some questions, but I urge you also to send more questions. Uh, and I start, I've also add a comment to one of the, those, the questions here. Uh, it's one from Axel. This is a side question on regarding possible negative effects of virtual reality or VR technology. Uh, he, he asked, anti-terror units and police have been using virtual reality to train and plan response action to acts of uh, acts of terrorism for years. And virtual reality or VR technology is now widespread on the consumer market and can be obtained at a reasonable price. Is it likely that extremists will utilize VR technology, for example, games or social VR platforms to carry out online radicalization or even prepare for acts of terrorism? Now, so just want to add that because uh, I noticed that you, uh, especially in your paper, uh, Ryan, and uh, because you, you have a lot of focus on the music scene and the kind of the connection between the music scene and music community and some of the electronism. But at least now it's much focus on the connection between the gaming community and extremism. And I know there are a lot of reports published on that topic, but of course the, <laughs> it might be a bit too early to conclude with that. But so these two questions, uh, maybe you can uh, address them. Yeah, I, I guess I'll start. Can, can you hear me OK? I'm, I'm having technical difficulties. We can hear you. Perfect. Um, so our study, I, I didn't have as much time as I would have liked to give a little bit of a background of the sample. Um, it was largely the older guard of the movement, um, meaning that uh, the vast majority of folks who we interviewed weren't Part of the younger gen generation of the so-called alt-right, for example, or these different um, fringe or extreme right um, movements starting to pop up around gaming, for example. So um, we didn't ask questions about gaming at the time, um, but I, I would argue if I were to interview um, members of different accelerationist groups, uh, for example, we would see that connection. Um, I mean, I've, I've written quite extensively on right wing extremist use of the Internet and, uh, and, and associated technologies with the likes of folks like uh, Maura Conway, for example. And one thing that we made quite clear in one of our pieces was that was this persistent online um, presence of the extreme or far right, documenting all the way back to the days of the dial up, all the way till now with encrypted platforms. Um, we didn't spend as much time on gaming. We, we published a piece a couple of years ago now. Um, and I guess what I'll just say in short is that the extreme right will adopt to and exploit any platform that they can at their disposal. Um, and gaming has become the latest um, buzz for them, I, I guess. Uh, they're, they're, they're constantly looking for new ways to not necessarily reinvent themselves, but uh, uh, re recruit or attract new followers. And they're most likely gonna, not going to attract as many followers on some of the older platforms uh, like Stormfront, for example. Um, they might be able to connect and communicate with a wider audience on um, gaming uh, streaming services, for example. I'm not sure if uh, if, if any of my um, colleagues want to speak more to that. Just yeah, to, to Lydia, you could stop sharing your screen if that is possible. I think you're still sharing. Oh, sorry, is that gone now? Yes, no, it should be fine. Great. You have any uh, comments on the virtual reality? Well, um, it's it's not an area that I'm by any means expert in, but um, I would point um, to some research on gamification and game, game, gamification techniques in their role in violent extremism. There have been researchers like Linda Schlegel, for example, who have done work on gamification. 
um, and how that is a means to kind of um, incorporate individuals more and more into the mu into the movements using um, gamified techniques. And certainly we saw um, some recent attacks like the Christchurch attack that was live streamed. You know, that obviously had echoes um, of gaming kind of techniques. And you can see how the, that kind of has set, seeped in um, um, into some of the lone, lone actor attacks. So I guess I just limit my comments to, um, to, to point out to say that there has been research on gamification done by some um, you know, excellent research colleagues that can help um, illuminate some answers to that. Yeah, thank you. I don't know, Vivek, if you want to add something. Uh, no, I think there are far more learned scholars in this area than I am. And, uh, you know, I'm following this on the margins, but I don't have anything substantive to add. Thank you, though. Yeah, thank you. We also have another question here. It's to, to Ryan. Uh, did your research show any findings on how one can spot if someone is going through a radicalization process from their online presence? And which websites or app uh, did the participants most commonly use during the radicalization process? And also, what factors did the participants point to as the main reason or motivation behind their deradicalization process? Hmm. Interesting. I'll start with the first point. So, um, myself, Vivek, and Tiana just wrapped up a paper now that we're going to be sending out for review today on looking at pathways out of violent extremism, looking at these interactions between. Um, disengagement and de-radicalization. And something we're finding in this paper in short is it's not necessarily de-radicalization, like they're necessarily thinking differently that's pushing them out of these movements. It's more the sense of disillusionment with everything going on in the violent extremist movement. They realize that their buddies aren't as buddy-buddy or as um, looking for a sense of brotherhood as they were, for example. Um, there's a number of factors that such as just burning out of being involved in violent extremism for so long that pushes people out. Um, so that's what we're finding. Um, we're hopeful that this piece is going to come out by the end of the year. Um, so we're, like I said, we're sending it out for review today. Um, in terms of um, being able to essentially identify indicators of extremism of the people going down pathways to violent extremism online, um, based on this interview data, we haven't looked at that specifically. Um, I've done quite a bit of work in this area, though, trying to, and it's something I, I recently presented at the uh, Advert Network uh, private seminar seminar um, on developing an understanding of, of violent and nonviolent extremist posting behaviors um, that can essentially shed light uh, for law enforcement on ways to detect these folks. And something we're finding in short, and it, this is very exploratory and something we need to explore in more detail, obviously, um, is that for the violent individuals in our sample, they are people who aren't the most active online. They're not people who are essentially the mouthpieces who are spewing hatred um, with thousands and thousands of messages. They're relatively quiet rel compared to the non-violent extremists. Um, I have a, a study currently under review right now where not only do I compare the posting behaviors of violent and non-violent, but I compare it to random sample of posters um, in the same platform with which all of them post. And I'm finding the same thing. Um, the, the, the violent are relatively quiet, I guess. They're not entirely quiet, um, but they're not spewing hatred. They're not spewing as much anti-Semitism, um, anti-Black uh, rhetoric, so on and so forth, as the non-violent, as well as the random samples. So those are some of the, the indicators that we're finding at this early stage. There's obviously a lot more work that needs to be done um, in that regard. And to the last point about what particular platforms are um, individuals in our sample of violent uh, right-wing extremists um, drawn to that facilitates the process of, of, of radicalization. I mean, we didn't break it down to the point where we're like, okay, how often did you visit, visit, uh, visit Facebook and these specific uh, Facebook group pages or um, what plot, how, on, how often did you spend on Stormfront, for example, or uh, the Hammerskins forum? Um, but what we were generally finding, and this is something we need to explore further, is that they were using all of their, their, play, their, their spaces at their disposal. And it, it was largely time dependent. I mean, um, Facebook was really popular when, um, when folks in our sample um, started to immerse themselves in violent extremist content, but arguably more popular for them were the generic right wing extremist forums like Vanguard National News, Stormfront, so on and so forth. So that's where they were connecting and communicating and immersing themselves in extremist content. Um, something I didn't get a chance to talk about. I think future work should really compare um, different time frames in which current or former extremists are immersing themselves and exposed to extremist content, uh, seeing whether there's differences over time. I, I suspect there would be, obviously. Um, and But yeah, that, that's a great question and something we need to explore in further detail.
Yeah, thanks for a very good good answer. And it's of course very difficult with the difference between the offline and online identities when looking at these things. I also want to kind of comment or question related to that because my kind of field of research is mainly on Islamic State and Islamic extremists. And then of course you see they have kind of been deplatformed to a much greater extent perhaps than for right wing extremists. And then they have been moved off of the major like Facebook, YouTube, things like that, and over to more this alternative uh, platforms or encrypted like Telegram and, and they're, they're complaining themselves that they could be OK these platforms to kind of communicate internally and also to use them for to planning attacks. But to reach new audiences or to recruit new people is much more difficult during the, using those platforms. But do we see some of the same same kind of uh, developments within on, also on right wing uh, extremism? Are they kind of deplatformed in the same way or are they facing experience with that. Lydia, do you want to answer first and I'll jump in after? Or? Sure, I mean only to say that, um, you know, absolutely in the context that I've been taking a look at, there's been similar deplatforming now with right wing um, extremist movements. Also violent conspiracy movements like QAnon have been deplatformed um, out of the mainstream platforms for the most part. But what we are seeing is that there's still um, a lot of disinformation that can spur people toward these movements that are still rife on mainstream platforms. Um, and so while that's still going on, um, you know, and the, the mainstream platforms have been responsive, a lot of times their response has been just that one step behind. So with QAnon and some of the far right groups, uh, for example, or perhaps some of the violent anti-lockdown, anti-government groups that have emerged out of COVID, um, you know, they still get their start on the mainstream platforms, you know, like Facebook and Twitter. The It takes a, a, a lag time for those platforms to then de-platform de -platform them. They eventually do, but they've kind of established a base or a following we've seen and then they move on to the alternative platforms where they may lose followers and they may have to um, you know restart again but what we're also seeing is now that um, these actors have become adept on them they've they've they're preempting their deplatforming, so they're signaling it before they're actually deplatformed. Well, they'll say to their followers, "Here's my Twitter account, here's my Facebook account, but also, you know, in the event I get zucked, here's my Telegram, you know, here's my <laughs> Signal, or you know, what what other what other alternative platform there is." Vivek, Vivek, is there anything you'd like to add? No, no, not not necessarily. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, I, I agree with Lydia completely. Um, I mean, one thing I see as a difference, obviously, with ISIS versus uh, extreme or far right groups online, and and like like most of us in the call know, I mean, there's been very aggressive measures taken by social media companies to take down any IS or IS inspired content it, it, proactively, as opposed to what, what Lydia was referring to as kind of reactionary steps that uh, tech companies are using after like there's a big event like the Christchurch attacks. I mean. I think that was a game changer in terms of um, tech companies realizing they can no, line, no longer um, turn a blind eye to the fact that there are violent right-wing extremists using mainstream platforms. Um, yeah, I, I also agree with Lydia. I mean, like um, different right-wing extremist factions are realizing, okay, they're probably going to get taken down eventually. So they're signaling to their followers that they're going to have to eventually move to other spaces. Obviously, they're not going to gain as much traction there, not gain get as much visibility. Um, but one interesting point I think to note is that, um, and we see this by tracking uh, right-wing extremist usage of the internet and associated technologies over time and media tools in general, is that they're pretty good at riding the line between hate speech, for example, and freedom of speech. Um, so as opposed to IS, for example, they're com I wouldn't say they're completely over the top. The vast majority of their a majority of their content, I would assume, is, and people in Western culture just don't have any tolerance for that. Unfortunately, people in Western culture have some tolerance, especially where I live in the U.S., um, for um, right wing views. They don't necessarily have to be extreme right wing, but the right wing views, which blur into extreme right wing views. Um, so, if you have that support by politicians, for example, tech companies are going to be less likely to start removing that content in fear um, of. Um, backlash. So the, things are complicated in the extreme right wing sphere, but I would argue that I think we are making b improvements in a Western context, for example, on ways to um, remove or um, essentially move or contain the content. 
Yeah. If, I may, if I may just add there, thanks Ryan for pointing that out. Um, I, I think is also uh, revealing, I guess, a preoccupation that we have right now with regards to the responsibilities of social media companies in general. I think that we can also look to our colleagues in criminal justice, uh, in, in legal spheres, to think carefully about how legal systems are able to prosecute for incitement to violence, whereas degradation of others, which is precisely what, you know, what we're seeing, regardless of whether it's from a right wing or from the uh, from from other extremist movements, the degradation of others in the uh, the current polarized social media climate is something that we tend to accept with impunity, right? From all factions, all sides of the spectrum. So let's let's not be under any illusion here that if you're liberal minded, you're going to be more polite than someone who's more conservative, right? So how is it that we can build some sensibilities around who takes responsibility for um, for uh, calling out? Going out to tell or to uh, to say within whatever 200 odd characters that this is unacceptable, but finding ways to say who, how do how do we then take responsibility? Whose responsibility is it? Is there a certain notion around publication and publishing rights that social media companies need to take accountability for or not? These are questions that we're constantly asking when I'm when I'm in a room with social media companies when we're invited and we're privileged to do so, we're trying to make the case that there needs to be a larger discussion around the difference between incitement to violence, which is punishable by law in Canada, for example, uh, versus degradation of others. The other piece around the IS is that um, I published alongside some scholars in, um, in, uh, in accelerationism, in philosophy and in consumer culture, a, a series of content analyses on eight Islamic State videos which is published in Terrorism and Political Violence, I believe in 2020. So uh, there to be around how the IS, as you point out, Ryan, you know, with the over the top um, elements there are really drawn from uh, some some um, some fantastical orientations towards cinema theory, especially Occidental cinema theory. There's something to be said around those kinds of analyses. We don't see enough of inductive content analyses of the visual arts and of, uh, of moving pictures and moving images, uh, which I think could contribute to our field in a um, in a uh, in a significant way. So I would just offer that we open the doors to that kind of that kind of multidisciplinary analysis. And I commend outlets like terrorism and political violence for being open to our paper. Uh, it took a while for us to find an outlet to 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 uh, to get it published. Just yeah. to follow up on on that point, Vivek, I think that it, you you brought up something incredibly important because a lot of the analysis is text based analysis that we're doing. It's incredibly difficult and time consuming, um, and not many people do it um, to do non textual analysis. So, uh, and what is it? What is the information or what is the content that's online? It's not mostly text. It text. It's video. It's memes. It's image based. And so there's got to be um, a big transformation, I think, in terms of, of, of what, what exactly we're analyzing. So I um, 100% agree with your point. Thank you for all your important. We have also have more to two more questions here, so we should go, go ahead so we will finish in time. There's one question from Anja. Uh, thank you for all such interesting research. And how do you think encryption technology, such as end-to-end -end encryption in social media platforms will affect radicalization? due to the challenge of content moderation and monitoring of terrorist content. I don't know who will uh, <laughs> try that one. I'll, I'll start. I mean, so based on our work and other empirical research, I don't think people just stumble onto Telegram channels, for example, and become radicalized. There's a reason why they're going there. Um, so. Uh, I think a place like Telegram and other dark social, as we call it, um, facilitates violent extremist ideologies. I don't think it is the impetus behind why people all of a sudden overnight become violent extremists or, or adhere to violent ideologies. But I do think, uh, like I was alluding to in, in uh, Mean Vivek's study, um, these types of platforms facilitate uh, violent extremism. They, they allow people to immerse themselves in content networks, so on and so forth. But I, again, I don't think that's the drive 
for violent extremism, violent radicalization. Um, I think there's other things going in the background. For example, something we, we, we described was looking for a sense of belonging, um, looking to be part of something bigger than themselves, uh, a, a number of different factors. Well, and so I guess in short, well, I do think platforms like Telegram should be um, explored in further detail. I personally don't think that's the push for violent radicalization. Yeah. Did you want to add something to that? Well, um, I'd concur with Ryan. I think that that, you know, that's that's spot on. Um, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of discussion. I mean, here in Australia, we have a lot of law enforcement and intelligence aid agencies constantly complaining about the need to um, get access to this kind of end to end encryption. And they continually use the words like uh, in terms like dark web without without clarifying what it is that they're talking about. Um, but I think this, the, you know, the issue with end to end encryption, along with the points that Ryan said, is that, um, you know, I can give you an example recently out of the Australian context where we've had a number of um, anti lockdown groups uh, conduct uh, a number of violent protests recently. And a lot of those um, anti lockdown groups intersected with uh, violent conspiratorial movements and some far right actors in Australia as well. And a lot of the, the, these protests were organized semi-spontaneously through encrypted uh, technology uh, platforms like Telegram. However, they were all through public channels. And so they're using these end-to-end um, -end encrypted technology platforms in similar ways of the mainstream ones that they were previously deplatformed from. So I think that, you know, we have such a focus on the, the issues around encryption when we really should be looking at, you know, how the open act, how they're using these quote unquote alternative platforms in similar ways to mainstream um, ones and doing particular workarounds around them. Yeah, Vivek, you want to add anything? Okay. So we have five minutes left and one question left. So I think we will that perhaps uh, ending the, the session after that question. And the question is, my research background has been focused on the use of magazines of Al-Qaeda and Islamic State, yes, like Dabik and Inspire, as a recruitment tool. And these magazines have articles and clear guides on how to carry out attacks, etc. Is there anything similar online from right-wing extremist groups, like similar kind of Dabik and Inspire and detailed instructions? I guess I'll start off by saying I'm not an expert in in magazines by any means, but I know that uh, in now defunct channels uh, such as Iron March and Fascist Forge uh, for what some are calling accelerationist groups or movements, or I guess you know they're just extreme right wing extremists. Um, they did, I mean, they did have uh, bomb making manuals um, that they were trying to share with other people. Um, I never saw anything specific around magazines. Some of the older guard of the right-wing extremist movement had magazines associated with different music movements, white power music movements. Um, as to whether that that is something that's still popular or not, I'm not sure. But as far as I know, there, there hasn't been anything comparable um, on the extreme right as there has been for um, uh, violent Islamist movements, for example. And I'm, Lydia might have more insights than I do, or perhaps Vivek as well. Uh, Vivek, would you? No, I, I'm, I'm just, I guess that I would, I would question the, the, um, the connections that, that perhaps we're trying to make between propaganda and or communication devices across different kinds of extremist groups. I think we need to first think carefully about the motivations for and the the impact, the communication impact of these propaganda items on a variety of individuals. When we were looking at the ISIS videos, we we framed the over the top elements around uh, ways in which they were, at least the, the, the people who were creating them, framing these ISIS videos were throwing back some of the, the tropes that you see in Western cinema around gore and violence. Uh, Right, uh, and they were doing this from the standpoint of actually reifying, making real some of the objectified violence that you're seeing on on Western screens. In, in so, you know, when you're looking at comparing across different organizations, I would perhaps urge just taking a step back and not trying to look for similarities as much as looking from within to see what motivates, what different different motivations do these groups have in order to to work through this issue. So, yeah, that's. That's where I would I would take this, but you know I think it's an interesting research project to think about. I obviously don't have I don't have not obviously, but I don't have the expertise in this. Yeah, 
I just um, quickly add to that excellent point in that, um, you know, this term recruitment, I think, we're, um, is used a bit fast and loose. Um, and I say this only because um, I'm involved in a research project that's being led by Professor Michelle Grossman out of Deakin University on mechanisms of recruitment. And we're starting to actually really deep dive into what recruitment means, how recruiters do what they do. Um, and I think too often sometimes we um, use the term recruitment to mean incitement or uh, inspiration or various other things. So I just make that point around the term of the use of recruitment. But, um, you know, in terms of comparisons, um, I, I think um, notwithstanding Vivek's excellent point about the need to kind of um, assess each movement and each organization out of its own merits, um, I think for the for the right wing, manifestos may have a similar type of um, relationship that some of the jihadist kind of magazines um, forward in terms of mobilization, inspiration, and incitement within that within that right wing. Okay. Ryan, if you can mute your microphone, I think there are some uh, sounds from you. Sorry, I'm I'm trying to technical yeah. difficulties here. Yes, no problem. But uh, I think we, are, we have reached the end of this <laughs> the seminar. So I want to thank you uh, again to Nupi and the consortium for arranging this very interesting seminar and to the audience for very good, interesting questions. And of course, to all our speakers uh, who participated and from very different parts of the world <laughs> and we are in different time zones. So I th thank you again and also wish you a good day in uh, in the United States and Canada and in Australia, I think it's a good, good night. <laughs> and also to the rest of the audience, have a continued good, good day. So, so thanks for now. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. <laughs>